Welcome to the Goose stage this morning, Dr. Grace G. Sun Kim. Uh, she is a professor of theology at Earlham School of Religion and received her PhD from the University of Toronto. She is the author or editor of 21 books, most recently, Spirit Life, Invisible and Intersectional Theology. Editor, blogger, podcaster, and pro prolific writer and speaker, we welcome Dr. Grace G. Sun Kim. Good morning. Thank you so much for waking up early for me. <laughs> you probably all heard of Reverend William Barber. Yeah, and you've already probably heard of Brian McLaren. <laughs> and you've heard of Diana Butler Bass. So all three are preaching and then you hear Grace G. Sun Kim. And you're probably wondering, who is she? <laughs> well, anyway, I'm here, so thank you so much for waking up early. And thank you for the organizers for inviting me because I feel probably no one in the room has heard of me until this morning. So thank you so much for coming. This is my first wild goose. <laughs> thank you. Anyone else first time? Wow! You see, all the first timers are here. Because <laughs> they didn't know who I was. Who has been here more than five years? Wow! Okay, who has been here every single wild goose? Back there? Okay, all the, all the ones, they're all sitting in the back. You all must be Presbyterians. <laughs> I'm a Presbyterian, so I would have been sitting back there too. Anyway, so good to be here. And I know words are so important. And it's so great that there are so many young families with kids. Yeah. Any young mother here right now? No? Okay, they're all sleeping in because they got the young kids. But I raised three kids, and the worst part about raising the kid was toilet training. Who remembers toilet training? <laughs> so when it came to my youngest one, I live in Pennsylvania. We were going to um, Toronto where my family lives. So it's about eight to 10 hour drive, depending on the kids. So before we left, the two have been toilet trained. The youngest is being toilet trained. So I said, nobody drink before we go on this trip. 30 minutes into the trip, my youngest says, I have to go. I said, what? <laughs> How is this possible? He says, he has to go. So we're in a minivan, he's in the back seat, in the car seat, and I yelled back, hold it. <laughs> he said, what? So I yelled back, because I thought he didn't hear me. I said, hold it. He yells back, hold what? <laughs> That's the importance of words, because if you don't understand, you know that accidents will happen. And there was a big accident in the back row of my minivan. So I'm glad that we are all here this morning, we'll have a word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the wild goose. Thank you for all the members and all the people that have come 
to this wonderful event, from the oldest to the youngest. May your blessing overflow this morning and throughout the day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So words are important. As I have experienced through my kids over and over again, and now that they're much older, they barely talk to me. <laughs> if I call them, they barely pick up the phone, but there'll be a text saying I'm busy. And I'm always thinking, how can they always be busy when I call them? Because I see their Instagram stories, and they're out and about all the time. So words have been important to me and the meaning of words. I was born in Korea, and I, we immigrated to Canada. How many Canadians are there? Yeah, back there. I met someone from Hamilton. Are you from Hamilton? Okay. The one Canadian from Hamilton is here, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> we got to get more Canadians to the wild, wild, where are we? Wild goose. <laughs> So I, and I grew up in Canada, and then I came to the U.S. in 2004 to start teaching. But words are always important. And when I teach theology, you know, I've got a husband who's a math professor, so he does numbers all day long. But I always tell my students, at the end of the day, words are all that we have. Right? To do theology, to talk about God... And words are all that I have this morning, too. So I'm going to read from um, Luke chapter 10, from verse 25 to 37. And before I start reading, does anyone know what that passage is about? Anyone? Yeah, good neighbors. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but okay, you're going to have to hear me again. So Luke 10, 25 to 37, the parable of the good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law, in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him into an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. 
Jesus told him, go and do likewise. You know, um, does anyone know the road that we're on? Uh-huh. Jericho Road. I find that so fascinating. <laughs> I came to the Wild Goose not wanting to preach on this, and then someone told me that we're on Jericho Road, so I said, okay, I'm going to preach on the Good Samaritan. <laughs> I grew, so I, our family immigrated in 1975, and I started kindergarten. I didn't know any English, and we lived in a very small two-bedroom apartment building with a small black and white TV. You remember the TV where you had to actually get up to change the channel, right? <laughs> yeah, I know everyone. See, back then, we didn't have the term couch potato because no one was a couch potato because every five minutes you went to turn one of the channels. There were only about 12 anyway, but you wanted to see what else was on. So I didn't know English, but I watched Mr. Rogers. Yeah. And it was only in my adult life that I knew, that I found out he was a Presbyterian minister, and I felt so good that I'm a Presbyterian minister. <laughs> but I didn't know English, but I liked the tune of, it's a good, what is it? It's a good day in the neighborhood. No, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. I can't sing very well, so I won't sing it. And there was a particular scene that you can probably Google and find where, you know, he talks about neighbors all the time. And he sat there in one of those small kiddie pools, rolled his uh, pants up, and he sat with the black man who was also on the cast. And that was very different because we know American history. We know that was very, very different. And to me, it made an impact that you can be a neighbor with someone that doesn't look like you. And that made an impact on my life. You see, this lawyer comes to Jesus and asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In our day, we think of lawyer and we think Johnny Depp, right? Camille. <laughs> Who watched that whole thing? Okay, good. One of my close friends sat and watched the entire thing. She said it was the best entertainment of her life. So we think, okay, Johnny Depp, Camille. But here, the, law, the lawyer is not the lawyer that we're thinking of, of Camille. The lawyer is someone who is the keeper of the Jewish law. He asked Jesus, what must I do? And Jesus asked him back, what's important for a faithful life? And he responds to that you should love your God with all your heart, your strength, and your mind, and love your neighbor. I think the first part is easy because we feel we can do it easily, and we can do it in our little closet, in our homes. But loving the neighbor is something different. And we ask ourselves, who is your neighbor? In that biblical time, this scripture passage does not say love everyone. It said, love your neighbor. Okay, that's a huge difference because during the biblical time, the neighbor is not everyone. The neighbor is someone that lives near you, that is a blood relation or a close friend, or someone in your clan. See, today we don't talk much about clans. 
So I'm a Korean, and I'm sure you have some Korean friends. And you know, many of us are a Kim, right? So I'm a Kim. And they say, if you throw a rock in a crowd, so this is a crowd, you can either hit a Kim, a Lee, or a Park. Because <laughs> it's such a common name. So my husband is a Lee, and I'm a Kim, so everybody thinks we're all like the same people. But you see, in Korea, we have clans. So I'm a... Gwangsan clan, and there's a lot of other Kim clans. And so we're not all related. But here, we don't talk about clans, so it's harder to understand what this is. But this passage did not say love everyone. It said love your neighbor, which was only the person next to you, your family member, your close friend, or a clan. And that's how they understood it. But you see, parables teach us something new all the time. You get different perspectives. That's why Jesus used parables. And so he uses this parable. And a robber gets robbed on the road, on this Jericho road. And he's kind of left there to die. A priest walks by. Levite walks by. See, there were actually specific laws that they cannot touch a dead person. So they actually thought that person was dead on the road. But he wasn't dead. And then a Samaritan walks by and helps this man. And Jesus says, do likewise. Breaking this concept of who a neighbor is. I think sometimes in our head we know who a good neighbor is and a bad neighbor is. I'm on social media and I saw this picture of a really bad neighbor. And the picture was they both mowed their lawns and then there was a strip in between where neither of them wanted to mow that middle piece of the lawn. We don't want to be like that neighbor, right? You're going to be nice and take the extra few minutes and mow the middle piece where the land is separated. We are to love the neighbor. Um, today, the person that introduced me, one of my latest book is called Invisible. And I called it Invisible because people all ask me. There's several reasons why I called it Invisible because I have a hard time remembering my book names. So the last few years, I said, I'm only going to come up with one word or two word name book titles because I can't remember half of my book titles. <laughs> They're too long. And my son keeps saying, Mom, your book titles are so long. So this one's so easy. It's called Invisible. A lot of people ask me, why'd you call it Invisible? See, you don't have to ask an Asian American why it was called Invisible. Because our common experience here in North America, if you were born here, maybe five or six generations, or a recent immigrant, is our experience is invisible. We are made invisible in society. In much the same way, we know that other people are made invisible. And we fight over these people in our churches. Can we ordain them? Can we not ordain them? Are they accepted into the body of Christ? Or are they not accepted into the body of Christ? I live in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And so many churches 
are fighting over this issue, even in the small city that I live in. And I know denominations are still trying to figure out, are we supposed to accept people or not? There are so many invisible people in our society. How are we to make them visible and accept them? How are we to love them as our neighbor? It's not easy to love the Samaritan because they were, they were the enemy. How can you love them? As you know, Korea is divided. There's North Korea, there's South Korea, and I grew up hating North Korea. It was uh, propaganda, and people taught little kids about North Korea. We, in Korea, we call it bargengi, which means communists. They are the bad people, they're evil. And then we had presidents who kept saying they're evil, they're bad. About five years ago, when Kenneth Bay was a prisoner in North Korea, he's, he's a Korean American, I was working with Reverend Jesse Jackson on, on trying to release him from prison. And I was really excited about doing this work until one day I was trying to organize a meeting with the unofficial North Korean ambassador to the UN. I organized the whole thing and then I thought to myself, Oh no, now they have my phone number. <laughs> they can trace me, they can find me, they can come after my kids. I, I had a panic attack. Because I grew up that North Koreans are my enemy and they're going to come and kill me. That was always taught to me. So the meeting was two weeks away and I had a panic attack. I couldn't tell my family because now they're gonna blame me for this that will happen to my family. So for two weeks, I was in, living in paranoia. And then we got to the building of where the unofficial North Korean ambassador was in New York City. I was in the lobby and I thought, should I go up or should I not go up? Because if he sees my face, now he knows who I am exactly. <laughs> I was debating and then people were all going, so I just kind of went with the crowd. It was really high up in the building. We got off the elevator, walked in, and they greeted us in Korean. And I thought, they just look like my brothers and sisters. We had about an hour conversation. The whole time I was relieved that they're not gonna come after me, that they are my brothers and sisters. We are to love our neighbors as we love God. And sometimes that's a hard thing to do. Those who are so different from us, ethnicity-wise, gender identity, sex, sexual identity, social economic status, education, sometimes hair or no hair, you know? There's so many things, there's so many differences. But Jesus tells in the parable, go and do, li do likewise. Mother Teresa was once asked, what is the most difficult thing you have ever had to do? And I'm thinking, Mother Teresa did a lot of difficult things. So I'm thinking, how is she going to answer this question? What is the most difficult thing that you've ever had to do? And she responded, see Jesus in his most disgusting disguises. To see Jesus in his most disgusting disguises. It is hard for us 
to love our neighbor. It is really difficult. I'm challenged every day. How are we to love our neighbor, especially those who hate me? <laughs> Once in a while, I get a really bad email from someone, some stranger, and I think, okay, I, I got to stop doing what I'm doing. How are we to love those who are not nice to us? The neighbor that won't mow that little piece of land and you get so upset about. How are we to love? And for me, much of my work has been on the Holy Spirit or the fancy theological word, pneumatology. You know, you can go to some, um, some party, and you want to look smart, and I just say, you know, pneumatology. <laughs> Nobody knows what I'm talking about. You can use these big words, and then you look so smart. But anyway, you know, a lot of my work has been on the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit. And I think at the end of the day, it is really the Spirit that helps us to love our neighbors. We can't do it ourselves. It's too difficult. That's why we sing, come, spirit, come. We pray, come, spirit, come. However you call that spirit, Old Testament, Ruha, New Testament, Numa, German, Geist, in the Asian term, Chi, However you call the Spirit to come and help you to live the life of faith, to love God and to love our neighbor. That is what we are called to do. And it's not easy. Because sometimes we hold on to everything that we want and want, don't want to let it go. I'll end with this story. I have so many stories, I have to write a book of stories. <laughs> so I can make money off my crazy life. But anyway, <laughs> I don't know if anyone watches K-drama. Does anyone watch K-drama? Yeah. It is so good, thank you, yeah. I feel like my life is a K-drama. <laughs> I have to sell it to one of, my, one of those writers. But anyway, when I was doing my PhD program, I had a professor, Dr. Obi Muhammad. It was a world religion class. And every, I had, every program is different. From University of Toronto, it was two years of coursework. And every class I went into, I always felt I was the dumbest person in the class. Because everybody was using words like pneumatology and all these like Greek words, and I didn't know what they were talking about. He asked a question one day. He said, we pray the Lord's Prayer, right? And incidentally, I grew up in London, Ontario. It was a very Christian city. Every morning, we prayed the Lord's Prayer. I don't think they do that anymore, but when I was growing up, we prayed the Lord's Prayer. I knew the Lord's Prayer in English, in French, and then in Korean because my mother pushed me to memorize it in Korean. And if someone just snapped their finger, I could probably do it in Korean right now too. No, but don't. <laughs> I didn't expect you to. <laughs> no, that's all I'm gonna say. But so I grew up with the Lord's Prayer and then he asked the question. We pray the Lord's Prayer. What does it say when we pray, let thy kingdom come? Everybody's putting their hand up. You see, I always felt like the dumbest one in the class, but that day I knew I was smart enough not to put my hand up. <laughs> Everybody's putting their hand up and they're all responding. He says, no, 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 anyone else? No, he's saying no to everybody. And I was the smartest one because I just kept my hand down. Because I know those simple questions are going to be a trick question. <laughs> so he said, 
What does it mean when we pray the Lord's Prayer and we say, let thy kingdom come? He says, since nobody knows in the room, he, he's a short Indian professor, so smart, I loved him. He was a Jesuit priest. He says, I'm going to tell you. He said, when we pray, let thy kingdom come, it means let my kingdom go. He says, when we pray, let thy kingdom come, it means let my kingdom go. That's a hard thing to do. We love to build our little kingdoms. We love to have people who are like us in our little kingdoms. But we pray, let thy kingdom come. We got to let go of the kingdoms that we love to build. We have to let it go and ask the Spirit to come. Heal us, heal the nation, heal the earth. In Joel 2.28, it says, I will pour my spirit not just on Koreans <laughs> or just on wild goose or just on Americans or Canadians. It says, I will pour my spirit upon all people. I will pour my spirit up upon all people. The spirit of God is upon all people. And we are to love our neighbors who are all people, even those that do not like us. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, thank you so much for loving us despite all our terrible ways. Help us to love you back and help us to love one another, our neighbors, our brothers, our enemies, those who are so different from us. Amen.